Well, I am so, so excited and honored to be sitting here with Ken Cook, who is the founder and CEO of the Environmental Working Group. I think one of the most important, if not the most important, oh, consumer health protection and ad activist um, nonprofits in the world. So, thank you. Ken, thank you so much for being oh, here. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's really, really, really special for me because I really admire BWG's work and everything that you've done over the last 30 years, I think, just about, right? Yeah, 20, 26, 27 years since we started. Yeah, lots of things have changed about what we do and how we do it. But yeah, we got started way back then. How did you come to focus on the issues that EWG focuses on now? So I know consumer and personal care products, energy, farming, food, clean water, non-toxic food packaging, non-toxic clothing, cookware, home goods, and more recently, yeah. cell phone radiation. Yeah. So, you know, what's the journey been? How did you decide to focus on these issues? Well, I mean, when we first started, um, this was, again, 26 years ago, is that like a quarter century? It sounds yeah, worse when you about. say it that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a long time ago. It was a, a group of us. Uh, I had hired some great people and um, had some grants from a few foundations. We were working on public policy. Uh, we were trying to develop uh, breakthrough research that would get media attention. And we would channel that media attention, the, the clips, the cuttings that you would take from a newspaper back in the day, actually mm -hmm. cutting paper. Um, and we would go to Capitol Hill or to the federal agencies and use the notoriety we had created around these topics, might be pesticides, might be soil erosion, organic food, what have you, to make change happen through the policy process. And that is still vitally important to us. We, we still have that model, and we're still very focused on getting things done by changing laws and regulations, but as everyone has noticed, that's getting harder. Um, in fact, it's really hard. The decades of environmental laws got passed and decades worth of regulations were issued out of those laws requiring compliance by regulated industries and their immune system kicked in and they started pushing back at the environmental movement with a lot of force. Uh, it became uh, partisan, unfortunately. It, it, it became uh, uh, particularly uh, important uh, to the industry to make sure that people they supported in Congress would pass no environmental laws and would slow down any environmental re regulation. And as we saw this happening, we were also hearing from consumers that they still wanted solutions to the problems that we had been telling them required an act of Congress or a new regulation. And it got harder and harder to tell anyone that with a straight face, right? How do you say to a mom? And, and for some reason, when I give a talk, maybe 80% of the women who come seem to be pregnant. Why would you come to a Ken Cook talk when you're pregnant? But they do. And and it just became very difficult to look them in the eye and say, you know what we need to do? We need to pass a law that will regulate those toxic chemicals, and then we need to get regulations out the door, and finally we'll get around to the chemical that you're worried about as a pregnant woman, and that regulation might take hold by the time your baby is in graduate school or has their own kids. It just doesn't work anymore. That and we also had a group of people in the organization who really were interested early on in, in communication online. We had a website in the mid-90s and we used our database work, which we had been using for policy. We started putting that over online and it turned out this was interesting to people. So we published information about tap water contamination, about farm subsidies. And we had a lot of traffic to our website. But the big breakthrough was when we, we published our first real consumer-facing database, which was Skin Deep, which is the personal care product, the cosmetics database that a thousand people an hour come to now on our site. And that really opened our eyes to not just the, uh, the, the value of communicating directly with consumers, because at the same time, policy was kind of collapsing. So was the media. It was getting harder and harder to place stories, even if it was really great investigative work, because there were no reporters. They were gone. The beats were vanishing, right? Environmental beats in the early 2000s just dried up. 
So we wanted to change a lot of things. Policy wasn't working. We needed a new way to communicate. The internet offered this new way to do it directly. And lo and behold, thousands of people were coming to our website. So from there, we just thought, well, let's, let's just assume from now on that we're, we're going to be our own media outlet. Our website is going to be our primary publication source directly to consumers. We still want to get in the newspaper and on TV, especially with our investigative work, but we really realize we, we can connect directly to people and we can hear back from them. That was the beginning of our, of our focus, our emphasis on giving people tools they could use to lead healthier lives in a healthier environment. Skin Deep for personal care products. That came about from reading a scientific article published by scientists from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, who had found elevated levels of this chemical called phthalate, or some people pronounce it phthalate, in the blood of women of childbearing age. And the CDC scientists speculated, well, maybe this comes from personal care products because that chemical's in a lot of them. We were, what? Personal care products? We'd never, we're environmentalists. We worry about clean air, not clean hair, right? right. We, what's, what's the deal? And it turned out that it was um, in a lot of products. When we looked at the label of some of these, you know, nail polishes and all kinds of other things, our scientists said, well, what are these other chemicals and how are they regulated? Well, they're not regulated. So we built a database, Skin Deep, initially to make the case for policy change, but people started coming to it and looking at our ratings for ingredients and, and full products. We started hearing from those people that this was a valuable source of information as they tried to detoxify for themselves a world that the government wasn't helping them to detoxify. And as that moved forward, we just thought, well, maybe, maybe we should just think about consumers on equal footing as an audience with media and policymakers. And then we, we had developed the uh, Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce, the Dirty Dozen, which drives big agriculture crazy. But uh, if you don't want to eat pesticides, that's the guide you need. And you can't find or afford organic. Um, we recommend organic always. Then we added cleaning healthy cleaning, we've looked at cell phone radiation, we've just looked across the board at areas where our scientists say it's ripe for us to take a look. There's enough science there that suggests credibly that there's harm. There are enough important questions raised by the research that's been done to think that additional research will, will probably show there's a problem. And we, we certainly from that science base, we try and then translate it so that people can understand it. And we finally now evolved to the point where we, not only do we rate products, but we have a certification program. We decided to start our own third party marketplace certification where if products went through a very rigorous process, well beyond just our rating system, they did things beyond that, they could get the EWG seal for a period of time and they'd have to sign all kinds of affidavits and demonstrate all kinds of uh, facts about their, their products. And that uh, has now become a really important part of our work because our consumers are, they're glad to know that some products rate poorly, but they're sort of like, well, look, I've, I've got student loans to pay. I've got a job. I'm worried about staying in NATO or <laughs> whatever they may be worried about these crazy days, right? Um, I'm worried about the elections being hijacked by a foreign power other things to worry about, just tell me, what's the good stuff? Yeah. What do you use, Ken? What, what should I wash my clothes with? What should I put on my, my baby uh, if they have diaper wrap? Just all of these. So our science be began to be more and more applied toward those vital consumer questions. And, and that's how a lot of people know us today because we're, you know, we're not, we're, we do these high profile investigations of you know, the Teflon chemical and the Scotch Guard chemical and drinking water contaminants. And we, we do get, but what, what people have really come to know us for is our advice to consumers and to people who are helping people like yourself, who are, you know, just trying to give the best advice from the best independent science that they can find. What on a personal level in your life led you to this mission and this cause? 
I would have to say that I've always been oriented to kids even though I had kids starting pretty late in life. And when the science began to show that these chemical exposures, pollution exposures, were especially harmful to children, that children weren't little adults, that a dose to them could be much more damaging than a dose to, say, an average 160-pound male, which is the way federal regulatory agencies often evaluate chemical insults. They look at what effect would it have on an, a human being of that size. It doesn't take into a, account the special sensitivity or, uh, and vulnerability of kids. We started or of women, doing, actually. Or of women, <laughs> or of women, of course. Uh, or, or people with compromised immune systems. I mean, the whole regulatory structure is, you know, if, if, if there's one sort of thing to take away from it, and we've had some great successes in the environmental movement and in consumer product protection and so forth. I don't want to in any way diminish the real wins we've had. But in many respects, what the government does uh, is not so much regulate or limit uh, exposures as legalize them. We set limits through laborious, long processes in federal agencies that establish once they're established, they, they are the legal limit, but that's not necessarily what's safe. Just because something's legal doesn't mean it's safe. We have a speed limit of 70 miles per hour on lots of highways. During the whole process of debating going from 55, which we did during the oil crisis back in the day, letting the speed limits go back to 70, many studies were done showing that tens of thousands of people would die if we went to 70. And we went to 70. It's legal it's not safe. And across pesticides, toxic chemicals used in industry, uh, cleaning products, personal care products, if there are any limits at all, drinking water, if there are any limits at all, and often there aren't, uh, they're, they're, they're the result of a, a fight between industry, agencies, and public interest groups like mine. The immune system of industry pushing back after decades of environmental law and regulation uh, imposing costs on them, making them change their business, has now kind of ground us to a halt. So for me, when I, when I f first started EWG, I hired a brilliant guy named Richard Wiles, who's really the co-founder of EWG, and he was one of the pioneering thinkers and analysts, not just in the public interest community, but he worked at the National Academies of Science, for explaining how we should really reorient our protective policies around infants and children. And if they were protected, as not always, but often the, the most vulnerable among us, if we were protecting them, the rest of us would probably be much better off. So once that started in the early 90s, at the beginning of e EWG, our first report was pesticides in children's food. And it made headlines all over the country alongside a National Academy report that was uh, along the same topic. We never turned back. We focused on kids and we focused on uh, the most vulnerable. Sometimes it's a mom and the exposure she might experience uh, that would har harm her offspring. Uh, sometimes it was a focus on the children themselves. Sometimes it was a focus on men and something that might reduce their ability to start a family. Um, we always had that, that notion that the regulatory system was in so many ways such a coarse instrument and there was so much harm that was sort of underneath it that was legalized and if if there's anything we stand for it's it's breaking through that whether it's through our own standards uh, we have dozens and dozens of EWG standards safety standards for drinking water contaminants now we don't have the force of law behind them but they're in place. We have our own rating system for personal care products and food and cleaning products. That gives you, I think, the sense that we, we really do want to follow the science. And if the government has not caught up, if industry has not caught up, we're not going to let those norms determine where the goalposts should be. And the goalposts, no surprise, should be health. When you drink water, should it be just a little bit dangerous? No. It should be, it should be health giving, right? If you eat food, should it just be just a little bit of a carcinogen? It's just hardly a little 
spit a pesticide in it. No, we don't expect that as consumers, as citizen consumers. We expect that when we drink water and breathe air, buy food, take something home from the drugstore to put on our skin or wash our hair with, that it's safe. And it should be. So our goal at EWG is to help people bridge that gap between what government and, and the private sector, for the most part, is, is saying is okay and what science tells us still has some residual risk in it and, and we can help people eliminate that. I mean, since we're talking about the regulation stuff, being a lobbyist, you know, for most Americans sounds like a pretty icky thing yeah. because we think of big pharma, tobacco, oil, but what I think a lot of people don't understand is there's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's how our government makes decisions. That's right. And it's who's screaming the loudest at them to do what, and they want to get reelected, so they listen. Yeah. And so I have, since I started Wellbe, have been thinking about, you know, how do I also kind of fight too? You know, yes, how do we show up? And so your, so EWG and your work is one of my favorite examples of that. But how do we get more clean brands and other nonprofit, you know, health protection organizations lobbying or having more lobbyists on their yeah, payroll? Or and because I know the percentage of money and lobbyists, you know, on the other side on trying on industry trying to get these yeah. products that aren't really safe into our homes is enormous. Yes. And as a percentage, you know, the lobbyists lobbying you guys might be doing and right. some you know similar type organizations or or brands it's infinitesimal so we need so much more how do we do that well it's a great question and we think about it all the time how to how do you activate people and uh, and and companies to to do the right thing when i started as a lobbyist back in the 70s uh, and and 80s and, and made my name uh, working on food and agriculture issues and then eventually pesticides and toxics it was a, you know, it it was still a period of time where the, the balance hadn't swung so strongly in favor of the regulated sector, sectors, right? Whether it was electricity or oil or pesticides or food, you name it. Um, and it's not just the lobbying, of course, it's the campaign contributions that that shape so much public policy. And it's why, you know, we passed a whole bunch of environmental laws. And then in 1996, we passed amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act. We passed a, a landmark pesticide reform law and then no major environmental protection laws for 20 years. I mean, most of the people who work for me at EWG uh, you know, have not lived through the kind of thing that we would experience as lobbyists in the 70s and 80s every, you know, multiple times a year. Um, so there is a need for that and, and I would, we, we try and approach it in a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, we try and get people to realize that while we're giving you advice as a consumer, we really want to have you think of yourself as a citizen consumer. You shouldn't have to shop your way out of these problems by going to our website, finding out what we think about something, then going to your grocery store or your drug store, or the aisle that has the cleaning products in it, fill in the blank, and shop according to our advice. We're proud to give it. We think it's vital. We're, you know, we're, we're really committed to it. But the government needs to be doing more. We, we shouldn't have a system of personal care product regulation that, if you can believe this, consists of the following. The, the, the FDA recognizes the Cosmetic Ingredient Review Panel. That panel reviews ingredients for safety that go into personal care products. The scientists who comprise that panel are hired, paid by, and housed in the trade association for the cosmetics industry. It's like a, you couldn't make this stuff up. Right, you just, exactly. When we, that was one of the first things that got our attention to work on personal care products. It was just too crazy and it took us quite a while to convince reporters that it, that was in fact the way the system worked because no one knew, like just like we didn't know. So the first thing we try and do is engage people so that they feel empowered by helping themselves. And you don't have to move to a remote mountain meadow 
and live in a yurt. You can live here in New York City and knock out tens of thousands of toxic exposure events a year in your personal life just by shopping smarter, eating smarter, taking care of your home, just behaving and buying things that are, you know, clearly superior with respect to toxic chemical exposure. But as we're doing that, we're letting people know that it's really important to step outside of your house, your world, and recognize that some of these problems are systemic and we have to deal with them as a society. And science tells us there's a compelling reason to do that. People are being harmed at the exposure levels that are coming out of smokestacks and auto automobile exhaust pipes and tap water and so forth. There's a compelling scientific reason to do that. We know there is harm. We try and make it easy for people to raise their voice by being in Washington and in California, the two main places where we do our policy work, let them know that we're there as their voice and the logical extension of what we're teaching them to do is to live as activated citizens, not just activated consumers. So you might be going from one part of your house to the next. First, I'll, I'm going to clean up my personal care products this month and then I'm going to move to the cleaning products under the sink and shop smarter for pesticides and avoid those through smarter produce choices. That, we love that, but we want people to also exercise that citizen muscle. And it still is powerful. It still can make a difference. It's, it's again, we're up against a, a tremendous pushback from, from industry and the politicians that they have supported and represent them and not the public in Washington. And there are lots of them. But there are also lots of people in Washington who are fighting the good fight. And in Sacramento and in Albany and in state capitals all across the country, there are great public interest groups that are getting laws passed at the state level if they can't get it done at the federal level. So what we say to people is, save a little of that energy. Give, give yourself a phone call or two phone calls. Uh, start every couple months. Call your legislator look at something on our website and say, you know, we really ought to regulate these chemicals that are now in almost 100% of the American public that were used in Teflon or in Scotchgard. Uh, or the chemicals that have replaced them that are also showing up in us, we, we ought to regulate those. We ought to have limits in drinking water. We ought to make sure that they're not flooding the consumer product uh, categories. We ought to make sure that if there's uh, a, a place in the, uh, where, where waste has been disposed of that has these chemicals in it, there ought to be a requirement for the companies to pay to clean it up. Those kinds of policy steps follow from the personal advice we give people and we feel like that, you know, the ladder of engagement that we all learn about when, when trying to get people online to, you know, in, become more and more excited about a certain direction that you're sending them in, whether it's health and fitness or uh, wellness of some sort, you know, you want them to start and form good habits, feel that good positive feedback, that, that success, that encourages them to take on the next task. But I think you're right, like, once you actually make that first phone call, yeah. and you realize it's not a big deal, and now you have the phone number and you know who you're calling, it's much easier to do it in a more routine way as things come up. Yeah. Um, and it does feel good, I it think. It feels to, good, yeah. To feel like you're, you know, participating in the American you know, democratic process yeah. of actually calling your legislator. Yeah. Or come to Washington when we have a lobby day. We announce them from time to time on different topics. And um, every day, citizens, moms, dads, you know, they, they break away and, and they, we, we bring them around Capitol Hill. And legislators do listen to their stories. And when we are working on legislation, we'll hear, yes, we're getting a lot of calls on that topic. Well, the calls are coming from you and people like you who don't make it their profession to dress up in a little lobbyist outfit like I do from time to time and go to Washington with a, with a necktie on. We, we count really on the grassroots to make, to make the difference and that comes from people deciding, you know, I'm going to shop smarter for shampoo, but I'm also going to call Congress and say, hey, why don't you update that 1938 law that regulates personal care products, right? So. The personal care, I forget the exact name of the bill, it's the Personal Care Product Safety Act yes. that was introduced to the Senate 
in mm -hmm. March of this year. Yeah. Um, it has sponsorship from a Democratic and Republican yes. senator, which I senator really Senator Feinstein love. from California and Senator Collins from Maine. That's yeah. right, the co-sponsors. Is that going to go anywhere? And is there any other regulation right now that's been introduced or you see coming up that you're excited about actually going forward? Well, I think there, there's a lot of momentum and, uh, and uh, Frank Pallone from New Jersey is the, the chairman of the relevant committee of jurisdiction in the House of Representatives. And he, he has been moving forward to introduce legislation that's a counterpart to Feinstein Collins. So getting something moving in both bodies is important, the Senate and the House. Um, you know, it's it's just it's it's very difficult. As I started off the, our conversation by pointing out, it's very difficult to make the needle move now. But I do I do feel that there's enough momentum behind this, and we have enough dogged determination amongst our leaders that if 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 possible, at least we'll see some movement even this fall and in, in 2019, uh, maybe marking up legislation, maybe getting it to the floor of the House. Um, That'll put pressure on the Senate. We hope to take action. Great, that's exciting. Yeah. On the negative side, um, are there any bills or acts or you know changes happening or recently happened um, that you are really worried about? We've been deeply worried, um, you know, with the agenda that this administration has put forth, uh, mostly in the environmental realm and the energy realm. Um, it has, it has to us been very retrograde. It's, it's moving backwards. Uh, at a time when industry actually is, for the most part, a lot of people in industry are willing to embrace clean power. It's a, it's a big sea change in the electricity sector, but you know, solar and wind and battery storage now are as affordable in many locations, most locations as natural gas, which has been the cheapest source for a long time. Coal is, uh, you know, trending out. Nucle no one's building a new nuclear power plant. Wall Street doesn't want to support the cost and the delays. And so you see an issue after issue just at the time when we have so much coming from the administration that is pushing us backwards. We had a ban on a dangerous insecticide, dangerous to kids, called chlorpyrifos. That was teed up at the end of the last administration when the new administration came in. They immediately, they met with the manufacturer and a short time later, that ban was halted and reversed. Clean Air Act, that's been weakened. The Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act, those are under assault. The Superfund law that we rely on to clean up toxic waste sites that have been abandoned, which plague uh, particularly you know, urban areas uh, all around the country. All of that is, is happening just at the time when we're really seeing new economies emerge that are, are, are so hopeful and that point to a future where we can move past some of the stumbling blocks we've had before. I mean, I, when I came up as an environmentalist, it, you were defined mostly by what you were against. What pollution you wanted to stop, what chemicals you wanted to get off the market, what, you know, what, uh, what land you wanted to prevent from being bulldozed for a construction project and what have you. We were against a lot of things and we needed to be and we still need to be because there's a lot of crazy dysfunctional uh, economic activity that uh, is, still needs to be minded. The government does it and public interest groups do it and local organizations all over the country are pushing back and they need to continue to do that. But we're in a different place than we were just uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Whether it's in food, where we have the organic sector emerging, uh, power generation with solar and, and, and wind and batteries, uh, personal care products, all these new companies and older brands reformulating, cleaning products, um, drinking water, uh, new awareness about contamination. And what it comes down to is this, what we're fighting for now, the future we can see, it's tangible. It's right in front of us. It's actually manifest. It's actually operating already. That future wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. It was sort of unicorn land, but now it's real. So what we're fighting for is that, that positive future. And it's as important as what we're fighting against. And that is, the sea change in environmentalism that I see going forward from, you know, 
my generation to the next. People going to business school as you did, when people ask me what the future is for environmental work, uh, of course I encourage people to look at the public sector, uh, look at uh, the NGO world, the non-governmental organizations, go to work for government, work in law, but increasingly I say, make something happen in business. Get a business background, make business something speaks. happen. Yeah. Make it, you know, it can happen faster and deeper. I don't care if it's safer cosmetics, healthier food, faster and deeper if it's done by the private sector than it can now, you know, this period by government requirement or mandate. So to me, the whole point of environmentalism going forward is to look for those positive opportunities. Even as we push back against polluting sources of energy and, you know, pollution into our waterways and all the rest, there's the, the, the future is really to embrace the positive. And, you know, that's, it's really welcome for someone like me who, you know, looks forward to being able to give people some good news. Hey, you know, you, organic is no longer private school for food. You can buy it at your, <laughs> at your, right? at your local store. My yeah. friend Phil Landrigan coined that observation. You know, we, we don't have to think of, uh, of electricity as something abstract anymore. You just have to pay the bill and you have no choice in the source of electricity. Now people can begin thinking about, well, maybe we should start electrifying our community with solar panels and uh, maybe we should start storing it uh, during the day if we're not using it in batteries that we can use at night without a coal power plant or a nuclear plant or firing up a gas turbine. All of these possibilities, right down to electric vehicles that are you know, beginning to take over, all of these possibilities are in some sense the, the legacy of my era of environmentalism where we just had to stop the really bad stuff and say something better is coming. It's organic, it's electric vehicles, it's photovoltaic cells on your roof. It's, but it's not here yet. And it seemed like it was like 20 years it wasn't there. And that, that really did give us sort of a little bit of a unicorn reputation where our solutions weren't plausible. We were stopping things that were bad. Industry was getting riled up, investing in pushing past our opposition. But now we can legitimately say, no, there's, a, there's a, across a wide spectrum of the economy, there is a new economy and it's built on the values that underlie those laws and regulations and those, those recycling events and those Earth Day events that we, you know, my, my generation of environmental leaders put into play and I'm proud of that. But now we need to move on. We need to invent the, the next generation of economic thinking, economic models, economic systems um, that accomplish that and also, you know, equity, fairness to workers. There are many other things we need to build into this, into this vision, but environmental uh, dimensions of it uh, have already been pressure tested across a lot of sectors and it's working. That's very encouraging. Right? I didn't expect to hear that. Well, I think it's really never been, uh, for all the difficulty of making something happen in Washington and all the rhetoric that's coming, raining down on the environmental movement, it's never been a better time to be an environmentalist. And especially for, for young people who are looking for a way to contribute. Um, yes, there are many tried and true routes, lobbying, getting involved with a local environmental group or nationally with a group like, like EWG or uh, the other great ones that are out there, yes make contributions if you can, but also in your daily life, in your business life, in your workplace, um, there are all kinds of new opportunities. People are listening, especially young people who are frustrated. They were, there were tens of thousands in the, of them in the streets here in New York City and in cities around the country just this week, earlier this week, right? Mm -hmm. making, making sure that the grown-ups heard that we're stealing their future because of climate change. That energy doesn't just have to be funneled into one route of joining a nonprofit group and devoting your career to that. That's great. We, we, we love that. That's how I've spent my career. It can also work in what, what you do at your kid's school or what you do in your place of work or your place of, of worship. Um, there are lots of ways to express that. And, and I see that happening now and it's, it's delightful because despite not passing more laws and regulations at the pace we feel like we need them. 
you can't stop that pressure. It's moving around the government bottleneck and making things happen uh, in other ways that are super exciting to me. There are problems with it. You know, it's not always clear what's, who's determining what's safe and what's healthy and what's not. The private sector process can be flawed, no question. But in the main, I've come to see it as, uh, you know, just a super positive force that we need to harness embed you know, good values, good science, uh, good judgments into, rather than just assume it's all greenwashing. It's not all greenwashing. Uh, a lot of it is from people who genuinely feel they want to make the world a better, safer, healthier place, and they just have decided to do it through a grocery store that they start, or a, a cosmetics company that they dream up, or fill in the blank. So uh, I, I love that energy, and that's a a part of environmentalism that wasn't accessible to us for the most part in the 70s and 80s and 90s. We didn't have that, that side of creativity and invention. And it's, it's great to see it now. I want to ask you about glyphosate. Yeah. So you, EWG, I mean, I read all of your emails yeah. and I know it's a big uh, issue and concern of yours and mine. And I closely follow, you know, what's going on with the different settlements around the country yes, for these yes. landmark cases. And also what's going on in Europe as far as, I think it was just yesterday that Germany announced they plan to ban yeah, short while ago. glyphosate. That's right. And um, obviously Roundup is the Monsanto's product and the main ingredient of that is glyphosate. If anyone... Now owned by Bayer, which is a German company. Which is now owned by Bayer, which is, a, I remember seeing a headline like, you know, they're going to need more than an aspirin for the headache that Bayer got, you know, buying Monsanto once all of the yeah. um, lawsuits started to happen and also settle for huge amounts of money. It seems to be everywhere in the U.S. and it does not seem like there's going to be any move towards regulation right. of it, you know, forget banning it. I mean, we'll never have that, but yeah. can we really avoid it? Because, you know, I know it carries through wind and through groundwater yeah. and it's in seemingly everything. Yeah. Um, and yet it's so important to avoid it. So yeah. what do you suggest to people? We looked at that question, um, we gave it a really hard look and our scientists uh, came to the conclusion, talking to scientists in the, you know, across the public interest movement, that the first thing we should try and do is limit the dietary exposure, the exposure in food. And when we looked at uh, the, the most, well, from, from the testing that we have seen that's been done, this weed killer tends to show up um, at the highest level in oats and some other grains. And why is that? Um, because oddly enough, these, you know, Roundup has become such a huge presence in American agriculture because of te the technology that Monsanto invented, which is bioengineering, genetically engineering uh, crops like corn and soybeans and cotton to resist Roundup. So you spray Roundup on any plant, it kills the plant. It doesn't have to be a grass, doesn't have to be a broadleaf, it'll kill them all. What Monsanto decided was if we can invent some way to, you know, kill all of the weeds without killing the crop, we'll have a moneymaker. And so they, they worked on that and they invented it. And so now over hundreds of millions of acres in the United States, the only seeds that are planted of corn and soybeans and cotton in particular and a few other smaller crops are seeds that um, are bioengineered, genetically engineered to resist Roundup. And so you plant the crop and, in, and what you used to do is you'd spray the field before you planted, then you'd plant the crop and when the crop would come up you would hope that the, cr the crop would race ahead and beat out whatever weeds were left. Now what happens is they, they can go ahead and plant the crop and then as the crop's coming up and the weeds are coming up at the same time, they just drive through it with a spray rig, the crops survive and the weeds die. But that is not the main route of human dietary exposure. What, what we're also doing with this weed killer is we're spraying crops at the end of the growing season just to dry them out. So oats in Canada and the United States, the oat cr crop is almost ready to harvest, but just to dry it down 
you spray Roundup and it kills the plant, it desiccates the plant, and it makes it uniform for you to go through and harvest. You can go through and spray a field with Roundup and know that it's ready to harvest within a, you know, a date certain. And you don't have extra water in the plant or you don't have to worry about you know, ripening that's not uniform. But because they spray at the end of the season, as opposed to corn, where they spray at the beginning where there's no corn plant. There's not very much Roundup in corn when it comes off the field, but there's quite a bit in these oat and wheat fields and some other small grains that have been sprayed with it. So we started off and said, okay, how do we, how do we begin targeting these exposures for people? We want to knock down exposure events, thousands of them for people. Following our advice, you can do it every, you know, every year. We we focused on oats, and it's it's everything from Cheerios to granola bars and everything else where oats are used, and this stuff has been sprayed on them. So we're basically saying to the companies that make that food, go to your farmers and tell them you're not going to buy grain that's been sprayed at the end of the season. It's not for weed control. It's to kill the plant, make harvest easier. Stop doing that. Tell your farmers you can't do that because we don't want this stuff ending up in our food. Now, the other ways we can be exposed to Roundup are tougher, uh, but we certainly want people who use Roundup around their property, and there are a lot of people who do. Most of the early lawsuits where Monsanto had a bad verdict lodged against them, sometimes in the hundreds of millions of dollars, came about from people who were using Roundup to kill weeds on their property with a backpack sprayer or some other system they were using, and they weren't even wearing gloves. If you wear gloves, you dramatically reduce the exposure. That should be required. Uh, we should take steps to formulate Roundup in a way that they, they formulated in Europe, where it doesn't drift as far, it doesn't get uh, people exposed who are farming the land out there. So there are steps that can be taken short of banning. Um, this is not the worst chemical in the world in a way, it's kind of a shame. It, I, I liken it in some ways to OxyContin. So OxyContin started off as a really potent painkiller that was designed for things like hospice care, for a, you know severe, chronic, unbearable pain. And for that application, it was really amazing, right? But at that level, it was only maybe a 30 or 40 or $50 million drug. The companies got greedy. Well, if we can prescribe it for, what about for a, a broken leg or a sprained ankle or bad headaches or fill in the blank? So as the, as the diagnoses for which it could be prescribed, as they got more and more approvals, that's when the real abuse began. Well, in the case of, of Roundup, it's a different harm picture. Obviously, I'm not trying to compare the harm of opioids, which is diabolically bad to the, the slower chronic harm of, uh, of Roundup. But in some ways, Monsanto decided along the same path that we, we want to take Roundup and instead of using it in the limited way it was in the early 90s, we want to engineer our plants in such a way that um, the seeds resist Roundup and now we can turn it into a multi-billion dollar drug for agriculture. That's where the abuses start. That's where the overexposure starts. That's where it gets in our air and our water in the springtime when it's sprayed. That's where it, it ends up um, in, in animal protein in some areas, and it certainly ended up in, in oats. So even there, with short of banning uh, Roundup, there's a lot we can do to reduce the exposure, and we should be moving the whole agricultural sector in the direction where, yes, there, there's a role for pesticides. We want those pesticides to be much safer than they are now. But none of those pesticides should end up in people, whether it's farmers or parents or kids or people in a retirement home. We should not have pesticides in people at all. And that should be the goal of agricultural technology now. Unfortunately, it's not, but it should be. Yes. I mean, I'd still love to see Roundup banned here, yes. but who knows if that will ever yeah, I think actually... Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to think that that's going to succeed, but we're, we're pushing hard on regulatory agencies to, to 
tighten the regulation dramatically. Yeah, and I think the the lawsuits has brought a lot of good yeah. media attention to the issue. Absolutely. And um, we tested Cheerios, among other things, and yes. found it everywhere. So There's that's so brought some pressure, products. too. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe how many they've found it in. And that's just the ones they're testing. I mean, I'm sure if yeah. you open the floodgate, it would be no, we most could, everything. If, if EWG spent more money, we'd find it in more products. It's mm -hmm. uh, just a matter of, of looking. Speaking of food, yeah. um, a lot has happened in the last 50 years um, as far as, you know, population growth, scarcity of fresh water, climate change, all these things we've been talking about. Can we ever go back to the way that food was grown before all of these things? I mean, I, just glyphosate is one issue, right, but right. There's so the many whole other agricultural and, yeah. process has been completely transformed. And now we learn it's really not that great for our health. Yeah. And luckily there is organic farming, but as my husband brought to my attention, like, if everything was organic, we wouldn't be able to feed right. how many people are, are actually on the planet. So what do you see as the future for food? I think the, there are techniques, farming systems, technologies out there now that largely borrow from organic thinking as opposed to industrial chemical thinking that are producing uh, plenty of food um, if we decided to go in that direction. I mean, we. A lot of the food that we grow with pesticides uh, ends up being fed to cattle. Mm -hmm. We should all be cutting back on meat, probably, most of us. I don't eat meat, but, um, you know, it's every, every bit of advice that's come, even from the government when they've been unmuzzled, certainly from international uh, sources like the, you know, the Lancet Commission, among others, the, the, the UN, eat less meat. Uh, well, we're putting a lot of pesticides into growing a lot of crops that feed livestock. Um, do, we, do we really want to do that? Making a shift there would, would be very beneficial to the agricultural system. If we, if we really wanted to eat more fruits and vegetables to take in the other direction, we don't, we don't really have much land devoted to that globally now. So we could grow a lot of fruits and vegetables on a, a fraction of the land we're now farming, and we could grow them organically. It would take more labor. There's some places where it's more challenging than others to grow. It's easier in a place like California where you don't have a lot of rainfall but you have enough water that you can irrigate so the pest conditions aren't so intense that you have to fight them off with weed killers and bug killers and, 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 and fungicides. But you do have to do that uh, back east. It's harder back here because of the so-called pest pressure. But we, we could move agriculture in that direction and feed everyone. We still produce lots more protein than, and lots more calories around the world than we need. It's just not distributed very well. Poor people don't have access to it, just like your low-income communities and families find it easier to buy cheap calories than buy fresh produce. So shifts in the system like that really knock down the feed the world argument pretty effectively when you add them all up. Um, but that's not where industry makes money. They make money selling lots of chemicals across vast acreages. And because that is the prevailing dynamic, and we have a whole subsidy system that supports that, your money, my money, going from taxpayers out to subsidized farmers who grow that corn and that, those soybeans and that cotton that's using all these chemicals and this uh, genetically engineered uh, technology and seed, if we started to unravel that a little bit in the public interest, we'd eat healthier and we'd have a healthier environment and no one would have to go hungry. We still have problems in parts of the world where, you know, populations are located where it's just extremely difficult to grow food of any kind. That's, that's a different structural matter. And in some places, they can grow the food, but they can't afford it. That's mostly how famines start. It's not food shortages. A Nobel Prize was won for this, uh, proving this. It's not so much that people can't, can't get food, it's that they can't afford it. They, it's, it's stockpiled right nearby, but they don't have the purchasing power to feed themselves or their family. So some of these challenges really organic and, and systems that are resemble organic but may not be quite as pure, can dramatically reduce the abuse of the environment and our health, give us plenty of food, but we need policy changes, structural changes to make those happen.
And consumers are a big part of that by making the demands they're making. Tell Cheerios, tell General Mills, I don't want this weed killer in my cereal bowl. Uh, shop organically, shop for fruits and vegetables at places where they uh, they try and give you choices that are low in pesticides, even if they're not organic, following our guide. Uh, more and more of that is beginning to happen, but it needs to accelerate. Okay, now I want to ask you, what would you say the three highest priorities are right now for people to do for their health in their home on their own to reduce their toxic burden? I start with food, okay? It's an everyday, multiple times a day moment where you can make a decision. Um, go meatless one day of the week. Go meatless on Monday. Um, we, we support that campaign and that eliminates a lot of the exposures you get from uh, contaminants that are in the fat of meat and in, the, in the, the tissue itself. Shop smarter for produce. Eat more of it. Eat lower on the food chain, closer to a plant-based diet. That's going to eliminate a lot of toxic exposures right there and is healthier for you. If you have a doctor who's not telling you to watch your meat consumption, you need a new doctor. And as part of that, you can shop for uh, produce, whole grains that are, uh, are, are purer, that are grown organically. And you can stretch a food budget a long way, surprisingly, by, by taking those steps. Second thing, I would look under your sink. I would look uh, in the bathroom. I would look anywhere you store cleaning products. And I would just systematically, you can go ahead and if you want to finish off what you've, what you've got there, don't dump it down the drain or throw it in the trash. Finish what you've been using, but go to our healthy cleaning guide and start, start replacing the toxic versions of these cleaning products to clean your counter or your dishes or your laundry with, with the ones our scientists have reviewed and have concluded they're a safer bet. Then, then do personal care. When you're in your bathroom, when you're looking through your purse, your makeup kit, um, go, go to EWG, and again, we, we don't want people just throwing stuff out and wasting their, throwing their money away in that way. These are all chronic exposures, so it's over a long period of time, and finishing up what you might have in front of you is not, you don't have to do that, but you can begin replacing them slowly but surely. Um, in your home, um, you know, be, be thoughtful about how and when you clean. You'll reduce asthmogens if you follow our cleaning guide. Uh, take your shoes off before you come in the house. I sometimes do it. I sometimes don't at home, but when we do it, we, we feel like we're not tracking in. You know, we, we live in a sort of a rural area, but still, we, we're thoughtful about that. Um, one step at a time is the key thing. You don't even have to be completely, by any means, organic in your food consumption to knock down a lot of these exposure events that we worry about at EWG because we don't regulate individual chemicals very rigorously and we don't regulate them in combination at all. So if you're taking in multiple chemicals that have multiple effects on your immune system, there's no federal agency that's controlling that or even studying it really. So you wanna knock down those exposure events by smarter shopping, taking the steps you can in your everyday life and it you know, it's kind of rewarding. It, you, you don't have to completely change the way you live. You just have to make these changes on the edges. And then I always tell people, find an issue that really draws your attention. Maybe it's when people want to start a family is a moment they come to EWG, and the other moment is when they get some bad news from the doctor, or when someone they love gets some bad news. Um, those teachable moments, li listen to yourself at those moments. Uh, and, and if it means you, you, know, you want to lead a healthier life for your own purposes uh, or because you need to lead a healthier life for someone you love. Uh, I, I took up a diet of, not quite a year ago and lost a lot of weight that I needed to lose. It was silly that I had it on me because I made a resolution to, uh, that was to my little boy. He was 11. I wouldn't do it for myself. I'd do it for him. So put that picture up on your computer or have it when it pops up on your phone and read into that. This is someone I love and I want to be around for. And even if it seems like it's a hassle for me to do it and I wouldn't do it for myself, I will do it for him or for her. I hear that a lot from Welby fans. Yeah. The most impassioned are often moms. And it really wasn't until they had their child that they, they wanted to start taking care of themselves. And to me, I'm I'm... That's so, that's so wild because I yeah. feel like, you know, the whole oxygen mask, you know, you've got to 
be present in your own body and really empowered in your health in order to take care of anybody else, or even if you don't have anybody else to take care of, you know, just to be there for your community. Um, and it's amazing how little we focus on ourselves and how quickly people can turn that around because the body is resilient. Yes. And so all you have to do is, like you said, reduce this toxic burden with a couple of these simple changes related to yeah. their products and with you know their their diets for the body to kind of rebound and say, yeah. oh thank God, you know, I've been been carrying around this chain and now now I yeah. can thrive again. So yeah. it's pretty it's pretty cool that way. I think it's very encouraging that just because you've been doing it, you know, in a not so healthful way for a while doesn't mean that's it. Doesn't mean your body is profoundly damaged, it can turn around. So. That's right. And it's it's not necessarily, you know, uh, an addiction level habit that you have trouble breaking it's that a lot of them are surprisingly easy to break and you know just speaking from my personal experience it's been it's been a revelation to me you know to to really focus uh, on that dimension of my health and pay attention to what i'm eating uh, i used a diet app that really worked for me that allowed me to you know look at the calories coming in and be careful about that and continue to exercise as i've always done but it, it was because I was focused on my little boy and my wife, my family, that I really just decided one day, you know, you've got to stick around for a while. I got, got to be a parent a little later in life. And it just, you know, hit me that, I, you know, I, I want to be around for them. They need me to be around longer. And so even though we take great pains to feed our family, our little boy, as much organic as we can, and we're careful about the cleaning products and all the rest, you can imagine. I'm on my website all the time. Of course. And my scientists are constantly telling me, hey, we just checked this out. You should take that step. You know, you, you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of someone else, just as you say. And that's what I love about this community that's growing now around, uh, around clean living, healthy living, um, you know, self-healing. Uh, there, there's a real dynamic there where you're you're taking your life in the intense and serious way it deserves to be taken, and um, you can do that about a kid. Some when I was giving a talk one time and I had featured my little boy on the screen in the talk, a guy came up afterwards, and this was before Cal was coming. He was still in my wife's tummy, but he was on the screen in my talks, right? Of course, and. Uh, a guy came up to me afterward and he said, so you're, you're having your, a baby? I said, yeah. He says, will that be your first? I said, yeah, it'll be our first. He said, when I had my first child, I had my first unselfish thought. And that has stuck with me ever since. It is definitely true, but there's another dimension of that, which is don't think of taking care of your health as you being selfish about it. That's not going to endure. Think of it as, as being something that you're doing on behalf of the life and the people that you lead that life with and how you matter to them and, the, and they matter to you. So you want to lift yourself up as you're, as you're protecting them. I love that. That's, I almost got the chills. Well, I'm not a mother, but I will be thinking about that if I ever yes. become one. So now I want to wrap up by asking you your, um, what we call our Get Well Be series. So okay. um, it's basically your can't miss wellness routine. Um, okay. So the you know handful of things, or maybe it's just one thing that every single day you don't miss it because it is integral to you staying well. And we say, I get well be by... Yeah. Okay. Blank. I get well be by moving, by exercising, by, by getting out outdoors in my case. I was able to do it, but I can, I, you know, I do it when I travel. I, I exercise. Um, getting yourself moving, even at, at whatever level it is or for what duration it is, science tells us it makes a physiological, biological difference immediately in your mood, in your energy level, and so forth. And that just accumulates over time. So. I get well be by moving. Um, I get well be by s focusing early, the first thing in the morning on, on what my plan for eating is for the whole day. I really do think through, okay, today I'm, you know, I'm gonna really be thoughtful, I'm on the road. When I go down to the hotel dining room, I'm not gonna do 
the smorgasbord, whatever it is, right? And I'm not going to pile food on my plate. I'm going to be thoughtful. I'm going to be, you know, looking at the protein I need, the, you know, the, the fruits and vegetables that are available to me at, when I pick through all the other stuff, the waffles and the syrup and the right. butter and all that, which you have to work your way through. And there's a real sense of, um, of, of empowerment for me when I, when I take the trouble to do it. And I now do it almost, almost every day. I try and think through what, what's my day going to be like? What's my trajectory for, for dietary intake? And, um, um, and that includes, you know, watching how much I drink. Um, I've, I've really, you know, become very thoroughly convinced that for me at my age, I need to dramatically cut back to, I don't even drink every night. I don't even have a glass of wine every night anymore and I feel better for it. I'm not preaching. I'm not, I'm not really trying to make the case that that's right for everyone, but I know it's right for me. And that's the thing. Until you try a few of these things and give them a week or so, you don't know what your well be formula is, but you can build it on your own. And with the tools of the sort that Adrian, you're, you're giving everyone um, that, you know, you're, you're going to be able to help a lot of people slowly but surely go up on that health curve. And that's what it's all about. And then, you know, you're in a better place to be a, an effective citizen, an effective member of your family and your community. Uh, no matter what might be going on, stirring in the world around you, uh, you've got that core. You've started every day by moving and thinking about we, what you eat. I love that. I have yet to hear the planning what you eat as, as part of a get well be yeah. practice. Yeah, um, daily. Yeah, that's, daily. that's terrific. And it's so smart too because where I hear that most of the poor choices are made, and actually, I mean, I know this from my own life, is really when it's, it's a, uh, I just have five minutes between this meeting and I have nothing to eat and I got hungry and so I, then I made this choice. It's not when you have, yeah thought put into it. When you yeah. put, th put thought into it, it's very clear to your body and your yes. mind as you're, you know, making the connections between what's good for you and what you might be eating that you're not going to decide to eat junk, yeah. right? You're, yeah. That happens more as a reaction to a lack of time or a lack of thought or uh, being in a place where there isn't, you know, yeah. healthy foods accessible, which is why I always have some organic nuts with me in a little yeah. metal you know, container. My wife thinks that I, I, I plan my day around where I can find a banana. That's a good way to plan your right? day. <laughs> and, but, but you know, airports, what a terrible oh situation, right? You're, you're desperate for something to eat. You know, the food on the plane is not, if there's any food at all, is not going to be great. It sounds so silly. And yet it's so true. You know, I, I really get a, a, a source of, of, you know, empowerment from, you know, walking through that airport past the gigantic pretzel vendor with right. sugar on it, whatever that's called, or this Anti the cinnamon yeah, bun, cinna cinnabon. Play, right, the cinnabon right. thing. They're like the size of my head. They're, they're over a day's worth of calories oh for most gosh, people. Oh my gosh, yeah. One of them. The other thing I, you know, I, I think is a good idea, and I'm a, a big fan of, uh, of Noom, the diet, the diet app. The, oh yeah, um, I'm familiar with Noom. I, I, I use that uh, very religiously for seven or eight months and that got me on the path now I'm, I'm not as good about it and I should be I should go back to using it more but it really kind of locked me in to you know the 1400 calories um, and and eating well to get to that 1400 and then you know giving me a little more ceiling uh, if um, if I exercised I bike ride a lot I uh, mountain bike I road bike um, and when I'm traveling, I go down to the awful hotel gym and I, by God, I'll do it at the end of today before I go out for dinner. And I'll spend an hour on, a, on an exercise bike looking at the news on my iPad. There's so many ways you can work this into your schedule that it sounds like common sense and I've heard it a million times, but it wasn't until I had, you know, I used Noom and I just made that commitment to my, my son and my wife wasn't until those things came together that I really kind of rebuilt myself at a new level. And everyone, since I'm, you know, Ken Cook from Environmental Working Group, people are like, well, maybe I shouldn't let him in my bathroom. He'll see what I use, right? Or I wonder, what if he opens my refrigerator? Well, don't worry. If you open my refrigerator, you would find some sins. You'd find some them. sinfulness, right? Them. 
that's not the point. The point is your is your direction, your trajectory, and uh, and your and your velocity. How how fast you're moving toward a healthier life. Uh, it doesn't have to be super fast, but you just have to know you're if you're going two miles per hour and you're making steady progress, that's great. Some people can do 20 miles per hour. Doesn't matter. It's the direction and that you have some velocity. So get up and move. Think about what you're eating during the day. Don't let the culture bombard you and overwhelm you with the bad choices that are heavily marketed. <laughs> oh my gosh, walking down the street, right? We're in New York. I mean, there's temptation everywhere. Right. And um, but you can you you know increasingly you can find options even in an airport that you couldn't find before. Right. Better food. Um, more fruits and vegetables. I went to, we go to Disneyland most years. It used to be horrible for food, but now you can get fresh cut fruit and vegetables there uh, from vendors. You don't have to get the, you know, cotton candy and ice cream bars, or at least you get fewer of them. Right. So, yeah. That's my advice. Things are changing. Things are changing. In large part to you and your work. Well, I don't know about that, but I'm very grateful to have this chance to visit with you, and I'm thrilled. With what you're, with what you're, you're doing with Wellbe, so best of luck. Thank you so much, Ken. It means the world them. to me that you were here, and I learned so much today about everything that you're worrying about and excited about and hopeful about. I know my whole audience will really appreciate this, and I very much do. So thank you again for being here. It's been my, wonderful. My pleasure. And like I say, what we're fighting for now is as important as what we're fighting against. And start by fighting for yourself.